Hi everyone, this is Kalyan Kumar and welcome to Chemistry Universe. We had just finished the lesson uh, Aryl halides and now it's the turn of hydrocarbons. Now I'm going to do hydrocarbons into alkanes, alkenes, alkynes and aromatic hydrocarbons, mainly electrophilic aromatic substitution. Now alkanes I'm going to do it in two parts, part 1 which is this one that is introduction and methods of preparation. In the part 2 of alkanes we will do physical and chemical properties and then we do alkenes again the part 1 would be the methods of preparation part 2 will we will be the uh, chemical and physical properties and part 3 would be dienes and then there will be two more parts coming up in alkynes and then we do the aromatic hydrocarbons uh, which would be basically uh, talking about the electrophilic aromatic substitution So let's begin alkanes part 1 and there is introduction and methods of preparation All right here we go so we have um, let's uh, try and understand how we are going to distribute hydrocarbons a uh, brief classification now basically hydrocarbons can be divided into two major broad categories aliphatic and aromatic now from uh, uh, GOC you already know what are aromatic and all those that are not aromatic or anti aromatic are called aliphatic we're not doing anti aromatic here mainly because uh, they they really don't exist that much and uh, they exist only for a short duration of time they're not that important to study so we'll be only focusing on two parts aliphatic and aromatic so aromatic are the ones which we know that are uh, cyclic they have 4n+2 pi electrons and then uh, you have uh, the aliphatic ones which are the ones which are non aromatic now aliphatic can be broadly divided into two parts acyclic and cyclic or alicyclic as we call them the acyclic is again divided into two parts saturated and unsaturated whereas the alicyclic ones are divided into again saturated and unsaturated the saturated acyclic aliphatic are the alkenes and the uh, unsaturated acyclic are the alkenes and alkynes whereas in the case of uh, alicyclic that means the cyclic molecules the saturated would be cycloalkenes and the unsaturated would be cycloalkenes and cycloalkynes even though cycloalkynes are uh, going to exist only in very bigger rings 8 and above so uh, so that's the basic uh, you can say synopsis of hydrocarbons so let's look at alkanes now now these are also known as paraffins meaning little affinity basically what this means is that al alkanes are very less reactive and uh, most of the time we're going to spend is in their preparation and very small amount of time in the reactions because there are very few reactions and that too very few reactions which are actually useful uh, for making certain products the bond between carbon and hydrogen is almost nonpolar because the electronegativity difference is just 0.2 so most of the reactions of alkanes are free radical in nature and as we know general formula is cnh2 n+2 so now let's look at the important part the methods of preparation and the first one coming up is catalytic hydrogenation of unsaturated hydrocarbons now alkenes and alkynes can be catalytically hydrogenated to give you alkenes and i'm sure you must have uh, read this in your class 11th or perhaps would be reading in class 11th this year uh, and that you know alkenes and alkynes you just have to add a certain amount of hydrogen atoms to both the carbon atoms to convert them into alkenes so the first one is catalytic hydrogenation of alkenes and alkynes Alkenes and alkynes can be reduced to alkanes by passing their vapors mixed with hydrogen gas over nickel at 473 to 543 Kelvin and the catalysts generally used are platinum palladium rhodium and ruthenium but since these are expensive metals we can also use rhenane nickel so we will talk about what rhenane nickel is in a short while but basically palladium platinum nickel uh, rhodium these are the metals that we generally use and we have hydrogen gas mixed with alkene in the presence of these catalysts at high temperature and pressure and you will be able to get the conversion to alkanes 
Now remember, these are surface catalysts. And by surface catalyst, what I mean is they don't actually participate chemically in the reaction. They do participate in the reaction. Their existence is important. Otherwise, why would they be catalysts? But they don't par- participate chemically in the reaction. They don't have any chemical process in the reaction. They are just there by physical means. And that is why we call them as surface catalysts because their concentrations are not going to affect the rate of the reaction, mainly because they are not chemically involved. So, you have an alkene, you have one molecule of H2 per molecule of alkene, you can use platinum, palladium or nickel and uh, take it to a high temperature and you get an alkene. Both the carbons get hydrogenated. The same thing happens with alkyne and you get the alkene. Now let's look at the Rane nickel, the poor man's catalyst. Rane nickel is prepared in two steps. First, the nickel is alloyed with aluminium and then in the second step, the excess aluminium is removed through leaching with NaOH and the active catalyst is now ready for use. Now, what this means again is the fact that uh, nickel and aluminium are converted into an alloy. We take excess aluminium to make sure that all the nickel are alloyed. But whatever excess aluminium are there, I digested or reacted with NaOH to remove them. So now you have a perfect alloy of nickel and aluminium and this can act as a very good catalyst and it's very cheap also. So let's look at the mechanism. Now here you have some blue circles. These are the surface catalysts. This, the, the, these are the atoms on the surface of the catalyst. And you have an alkene there. What happens is this alkene comes down, weakens its pi bond and forms a weak bond with the catalyst. Now you will find a hydrogen molecule coming down to the catalyst and then it forms a weak bond with the catalyst and then aligns itself to the carbon atoms and forms a bond with them and escapes out as alkene. So if you want to see another way of looking at this animation, let's have a look here. So let's have a look here. Again, alkene coming, binding with the catalyst, pi bond weakens, and there you have the hydrogen molecule rolling over and attaches to the two carbons of the alkene and forms an alkene and goes away. Now what is important to note here is that the hydrogenation reaction is a syn addition. This means that both the hydrogens are attaching to the alkene from the same side of the alkene. So alkene is planar and the two hydrogens are here and the two hydrogens break and they attach themselves to the alkene and that gives them the idea that they can attach them from the same side of the carbon, of the alkene. So it's called a syn addition and this has major implications in the stereochemistry of the alkene of the or the alkene form. This means both the hydrogen atoms get added to the alkene from the same side of the alkene. And this reaction is also known as the sabater sendrenes reaction. So what I want you to do is look at this molecule, carry out hydrogenation, and I want you to make the product alkene fissure form. So the best way to do this is take the alkene, imagine the hydrogen is coming from one side, both of them, make the sawhorse projection and then make the fissure projection. So pause the video, make it on your own, make the fissure projection and check your answer. So what is happening is, I am assuming both the hydrogens are coming from the bottom and this is what I get, the sawhorse projection. Remember, it's a cis alkene, so I have the two seals on the same side here. But remember, when we draw the fissure projection, we like to bring the ME down. So I rotate this and bring the ME down. When I bring the ME down, what do I get? If these two are ME's, then obviously to bring the ME down, my CLs will come on the left and the H will come on the right in both of them. That is more important. So what we get is this as the fissure projection. Now similarly, Alkynes get hydrogenated to alkenes and then to alkanes using the above catalyst. To stop at the alkene stage, we need to use different catalysts 
which we'll discuss in alkenes so remember it's difficult to stop alkynes to alkenes you need special catalyst which will do in the preparation of alkenes so using these catalysts that i mentioned alkynes will always go to alkenes So if you have uh, this compound, and uh, now by writing H two, I don't mean I'm adding one molecule of H two. I'm adding as much H two as required. So what do you think will be the product? Pause the video. Make the product. Then check your answer. So obviously both the alkene and the alkyne will get hydrogenated, and the four carbons will get butane. Now there is another way of hydrogenation called transfer hydrogenation. The transfer hydrogenation or TH is a reaction in which hydrogen atom is transferred to an acceptor molecule from another molecular species other than molecular hydrogen acting as a donor. So here we have an uh, alkene and we have another molecule that is capable of giving H2. Now why it gives H2 obviously it must be gaining stability by giving H2 and we will see some examples for that. But the fact of the matter is, instead of using molecular hydrogen, we use another molecule that is capable of giving hydrogen molecule, which will get transferred to this alkene, and this alkene will become alkane, and that compound would get unsaturation. So let's say, for example, I take two mole of uh, this particular alkene, and I take one mole of this compound, cyclohexene. Now, what do you think would be the product? Again, pause the video, make, and then check. Now, obviously, what will happen is these two carbons are going to lose one one H, so that there's a conjugated double bond. These two hydrogens will also be lost for the second molecule of alkene. You'll get a double bond here. So, what do you think will be the product? The product is going to be alkene and benzene, and is the formation of benzene which is the driving force. Similarly, you can use hydrazine. What do you think will happen here? Hydrogen will lose. Both the H, both the nitrogen will lose both the H. You will get N two molecule, and the driving force is the N two molecule. So the driving force in the case of uh, cyclohexene is the gain in aromaticity, and in hydrazine is the formation of a strong N triple bond N. Now let's look at the second reaction that is called the Woods reaction. Now an ethyl solution of an alkyl halide, preferably bromide or iodide. Is treated with sodium when alkane is obtained. You can even treat it with lithium. For example, you take two Rx and you take two Na and you treat this with ether. You will get RR and you will get two NaX. Now, in this reaction, the two R groups coupled by the reaction of RBr, RCl, or Ri with Na or K. You can even use lithium, as I said. The yields of the product are best for primary and least for tertiary. And we'll understand why that in a short while. Now, if we use two different alkyl halides, let's say R X and R prime X, then apart from getting R R prime, which is probably the intended product, we also get R R and R prime R prime. Moreover, we will also get some unsaturated hydrocarbons. So, so the point is that if you use R X and R prime X, the R X can couple with another R X to give R R. R prime X and R prime X can couple to give R prime R prime, and these two can couple with themselves to give R R prime. So basically, you're getting three product, which means neither of product one, two, three of or, or anything we we are going to get in good yield. So it's always better to use a single R X rather than a mixture, so that you can get at least one alkane properly, which is R R. To get the best yield, we need to keep R and R prime same. Therefore, this reaction is suited for even numbered symmetrical hydrocarbons. So obviously, R R any molecule which is R R has to be even numbered. Doesn't matter whether R is even or odd. R R will always be even. Moreover, it will be symmetrical. So whenever you are asked a question, which of the following alkanes can be best prepared by Wood's reaction? First, look for where R R is present. That means carbon should be even and it should be symmetrical. At the same time, as we mentioned here, the primary ones are the ones which give the best yield. So also look for that particular alkane that can be prepared by Wood's reaction using primary alkyl halides. All right. 
so other than uh, sodium ag and cu can also be used in the finely divided state there are two mechanisms by which this can be explained first is the free radical one which is very commonly given the two nas in the presence of ether would uh, oxidize now the two rx will each take one one electron and the x minus will leave leaving you with a r radical and cl minus ion remember when rx breaks into this you're going to get r plus if it takes one electron it will become r dot so two rx will take two electrons and form two r dot now when these two r dots meet you get rr and of course the na and cl will form nacl but since the solution is ether nacl is insoluble so it will precipitate which is why i'm showing you this reaction there is another mechanism called the ionic mechanism which really helps in understanding the uh, unsaturation products so 2 na ether same process now instead of one electron attacking one rx you get two electrons attacking the rx giving you r minus and x minus Now, since some of the Rx are unreacted by the electrons because both electrons have been taken by one Rx itself, one R minus acts as a nucleophile to attack the other Rx as uh, a nucleophilic substitution will attack the R and remove the X minus, forming RR and X minus, and again NaX is produced. Now, the reaction is used for the ascent of series uh, or increasing the number of carbon chain, but there are some side products. as i said especially when you use secondary and tertiary what will happen is if you have this particular compound so what will happen is one dot will react with the h of the adjacent carbon the ch bond goes in here this comes here and you'll get ethane and ethene so now i'm going to give you a couple of examples i want as usual to you to take notes as i have always said and uh, write down these examples as they are given then pause the video then make the product and then play the video back to check the product so here we have the examples here the first one is this one na ether so what do you think will be the product pause the video now obviously dimerization something like this what do you think will happen here pause again you will get a dimerization like this what do you think will happen here now remember in this case intramolecular reactions are more favorable so if both become dot they will join with themselves giving you a bicyclo compound try this one and i want you to make both the intra and the inter So what would be the intra product? Cyclobutene, inter product. Two cyclobutanes connected to each other, and basically means three boxes. Try this. So simple logic. Now the best way to do this is draw the benzene like this. It will be easy for you. And uh, you have uh, one. ethyl dot oh sorry one methyl dot and one methyl dot here and again make this these two will meet these two will meet and your product is going to look like this one try this make both inter and intra intra would be this and inter would be this but remember intra is always preferred try this so you get a dot here you get a dot here they will join dot dot they will join so essentially you will get something like this try this two dots meet which of the following can be produced by wood's reaction in good yield now i give you the following options first thing check whether the carbons are even now this has got six carbons i think yeah this has got 3 uh, 4 and 3 uh, 4 so 
so that is 8 this is got 3 3 6 7 this is 7 not possible this is 3 plus 2 6 but it's unsymmetrical so these two are gone anyway now out of these two this can be produced only when there is a secondary bromide right secondary halide whereas this can be produced because this is also symmetrical this can be produced if you had a primary bromide and remember primary gives you a better yield than secondary so the answer is b so reactivity of alkyl halide towards woods reaction would be ri rbr rcl better leaving group now a reaction very similar to the woods reaction is the frankland only difference being you use zinc and you get RR and zinc halide. Now again the mechanism everything is same. Now let's look at Kolb's electrolysis. Now a concentrated aqueous solution of the sodium or potassium salt of a carboxylic acid or a mixture of carboxylic acids is electrolyzed to yield an alkane. Meaning you take a carboxylate ion, add water, do electrolysis and you get RR, then you get CO2 and then you get NaOH and H2. So I'm going to show you how this electrolysis mechanism happens. So since it is electrolysis, we'll do reduction and oxidation at anode and cathode, reduction in cathode, oxidation in anode and I'll show you why RR is formed. Again in this case, we use the same carboxylate ion RCOONA. Now we could have used RCOO minus, we could have used R prime CO minus in mixing with each other, but you'll get the same problem as you got in the Woods reaction. You'll get RR, you'll get R prime, R prime, or you'll get R R prime. So we want a good yield, so we would prefer the same carboxylate ion. All right, so here we go. So this is the mechanism. You have the sodium carboxylate breaking into carboxylate ion and Na plus. Water, as you know, breaks into H plus and OH minus. Now at anode, the carboxylate ion is going to give an electron and form carboxylate radical. The carboxylate radicals, on the other hand, will disproportionate. One dot comes here, the R and C bond breaks, it comes here and you get two R dots and you get a CO2. Now the two R dots will combine to give RR. Whereas at cathode, the H plus reduces to give H2 gas. And obviously, the uh, OH minus formed, that is this OH minus formed, is going to react with Na plus to form NaOH. And some of the byproducts of Kolb's electrolysis are the R2 dots can meet together. You can get the RQ dot meeting the R dot. And obviously two R dots meeting which is anyway the desired product. To get the best yield, we'll need to keep the R and R prime same. Therefore, this reaction is again suited for even numbered symmetrical hydrocarbons. Let's check out some of the examples. You have sodium acetate, electrolysis. What do you think will happen? What are the radicals you'll get? Pause and play. So you'll get a methyl radical, two methyl radicals meet ethane. What do you think will happen to this one? Obviously, the two carbons having the carboxylates will become dots and they'll give you ethene. And if you want to look at inter, you'll get cyclobutane. Ethene will be major. What do you think will happen to this one? Won't you get this? How about this one? I think this is pretty simple now. You get e, uh, acetylene and of course you can get this but this is not going to form at all because it is anti-aromatic. Then we do soda lime decarboxylation also known as the Dacwood process or Dacwood degradation. Now in decarboxylation reaction, a carboxylic acid loses its COH group and a hydrogen atom is added to the hydrocarbon group giving an alkane. Basically what happens is, if you have RCOOH, 
this will decarboxylate giving CO2 and this H will get attached to R. So you get RH. You won't get RR, you'll get RH. So sodium or potassium salts of carboxylic acids are heated in the presence of soda lime to give you decarboxylate them into alkenes. So basically you get a sodium carboxylate, soda lime, soda lime is NaOH and CaO mixture heated. So the CO2 goes away, you get R minus and Na plus, acidified this and you get RH. Mechanism. There are two mechanisms for this. And the, the first one goes like this, you get the carboxylate ion, which breaks into carboxylate and Na plus. Now this carboxylate ion is attacked by hydroxide on this electrophilic carbon. So attack here, pi bond goes to O and you'll get something like this. Now the O minus comes back and a very bad leaving group R minus will leave, which is why this should be the ray determining step. And this R minus will react with this bicarbonate ion. This is a bicarbonate ion. It will take the proton and form RH and give you carbonate ion. This carbonate can react with both Na plus and, car and calcium ions to give you Na2CO3 or CaCO3 or both. The second mechanism, however, and I say, as I said, this is RDS. The second mechanism is carboxylate ion is produced. Now this carboxylate ion will rearrange and dissociate into R minus and CO2 and this R minus picks up the H plus and gives you RH. Now in both mechanisms, remember the step in which the R minus, here the R minus, this is the RDS, here this is the RDS. So wherever R minus is formed, that is the RDS. So anything that stabilizes the R minus is going to make the reaction go faster. So in both mechanisms, the RDS involves the formation of a carbon ion and therefore the rate of decarboxylation is directly proportional or rather qualitatively directly related to the stability of the carbon ion formed. Now basically the question arises, why do we use soda lime? I mean, why do we use NaOH and uh, calcium oxide? Basically it is calcium hydroxide that we use. So basically what happens is that uh, one main reason is that uh, NaOH is very moisture absorbent. And therefore if you use NaOH pellets, which is what how they come, they'll quickly take water from the, moisture, uh, from the air and uh, they will become, you know, sort of uh, semi-solid uh, things and uh, it's going to be very difficult to use them in dry conditions. So we use CaO along with it so that it can absorb the moisture. At the same time, the formation of CaCO3 helps drive the reaction forward. Soda lime is manufactured by adding sodium hydroxide to solid calcium oxide quick lime. It is essentially a mixture of NaOH, CaO and CaOH twice. It comes as white granules. Now in equations, it is generally written as simply sodium hydroxide sometimes. Sometimes they will not even write CaO. Now, it is an easier material to handle than solid NaOH. Solid NaOH absorbs water from the atmosphere and you tend to end up getting puddles of extremely concentrated and corrosive NaOH solution if you leave it exposed to air. CaCO3 being hygroscopic absorbs moisture and keeps NaOH dry. Moreover, the CaO also helps in converting the CO2 form to carbonate which drives the equilibrium forward. Even carboxylic acids can be converted to alkenes as they first will react with NaOH to form sodium carboxylate themselves. So even if you don't use the uh, RCO minus salt, you can still get the product because the RCOH will re react with NaOH to form RCO minus. So you have uh, compared the rate of decarboxylation. Again, you have to see which, is, which carbon ion is more stable. So check these two out. Pause the video now, make the, uh, uh, give your answer which has a higher rate based on the carbon ion stability and then check your answer. Now obviously this negative is resonance stabilized whereas this negative is not. So one should be more than two. Similarly, you have uh, 
these two to tell me which one has a better carbon ion stability obviously one minus m group now here which carbon ion do you think is more stable obviously the second one there are two minus m groups try these two again one has a better carbon ion due to resonance try these two obviously the carbon ion of 2 will be better because of less plus i effect try these obviously the carbon ion of 1 is aromatic and 2 is anti aromatic try these obviously the carbon ion of 1 uh, is going to be more stable because it will be able to create a double bond there and you get an aromatic thing more resonance you can put it that way if not aromatic more resonance look at this one which carbon ion has resonance obviously one has look at this one now here both carbon ions will have resonance but remember a double bond pi bond will be longer than a triple bond pi bond because the internuclear axes are closer in triple bond because of sp hybridization more s character so it is easier to distort a double bond pi bond than a triple bond pi bond try this obviously the carbon ion of 2 is going to be more stable because of back bonding now in case of beta keto acids soda lime is not required and it can be decarboxylated by simply heating alone you have beta keto acid even if they don't use soda lime merely heating you will get ketone as well as co2 and the way this happens is it's a concerted mechanism i am writing the beta keto acid like this the bonds of this oh bond they break first and form a bond with the other oh other o is internal and the pi bond of o will go to the carbon the carbon sigma bond with carbon will go between carbon and o and you will get the six member transition state which eventually will give you a enol which will tautomerize to give you ketone now some of the examples can you see beta keto acid what will happen it will form cyclohexanone what do you think will happen here which coh will go obviously the one which has a beta keto to it now look at 3 which one is going to go all the carboxylic acids if you notice are beta keto so all of them will go what do you think happens here now here one coh acts as a beta keto for the other carboxylic acid so one will go the other won't because when one goes the other will simply become acetic acid and this cannot decarboxylate merely by heating what about this one well you may get a carbon ion here but it's not going to be stabilized okay or for that matter you can just try and see in the transition state this bond becomes partially double which is not possible because of being a bridge head now decarboxylation on heating can also happen in the following cases besides the beta keto here also you will get simple decarboxylation by heating you can get it here also and you can get here also then comes the process of reduction of alkyl halides using lah sbh tph and tbh basically lah stands for lithium aluminum hydride lialh4 sbh is sodium borohydride and the tph is triphenyl uh, tin hydride and tbh is tributyl tin hydride now any hydride donor can be employed for this purpose commonly used are lh lithium aluminum hydride that is lialh4 sbh is sodium borohydride that is nabh uh, nabh4 
टी पी एच इज ट्राई फिनाइल्टीन हाइड्राइड दैट इज पी एच थ्री एस एन एच और टी पी एच इज ट्राई ब्यूटाइल्टीन हाइड्राइड और सी फोर एच नाइन थ्राइस एस एन एच बेसिकली दिस इज वॉट हैपन हेयर यू अंडरस्टैंड समथिंग एंड दैट इज एल एच इज अ स्ट्रॉन्ग न्यूक्लिफाइल एल ए एच एलुमिनियम इज अ मेटल तो इट गिवस यू लॉर्ड ऑफ एच माइनस एंड मैन गिव यूज लॉर्ड ऑफ एच माइनस दिस एच माइनस इज प्री स्ट्रॉन्ग न्यूक्लिफाइल Being a strong nucleophile, what it would do is you can easily substitute primary and secondary by SN two. But with tertiary, the problem is you have to use a polar protic solvent because it has to go by SN one. So when you get a tertiary and once you get a carbon ion, a carbonium ion, this carbonium ion would make all its alpha H acidic by hyperconjugation. So when a strong nucleophile like H minus, which is also a strong base, gets to see protons. it would tend to attract the proton rather than act as a nucleophile so it will eliminate here so lh cannot reduce tertiary on the other hand nabh4 cannot reduce primary it can only do secondary and tertiary by sn1 but for primary it needs a strong nucleophile and boron being less electropositive than aluminum the hydrogen of boron is not sufficiently nucleophilic nucleophilic enough to act as a nucleophile in sn2 So NaBH4 can do secondary and tertiary, but not primary. Whereas TBH and uh, the other one, TPH, they are all going to react with all of the three because their mechanism is completely different. It is free radical. It is observed that LAH can reduce primary and secondary halides, while um, with the tertiary, it gives um, alkenes. NaBH4 reduces secondary and tertiary, and uh, while it hardly reacts with uh, primary and the tributyl tin reduces all the three now aluminum is a metal while boron is not so the h attached to aluminum carries more negative charge as it is compared to uh, boron consequently the hydride of lh is more nucleophilic compared to nabh4 now in the case of primary and secondary halides the substitution occurs through sn2 because the substrate supported and the nucleophile is strong so primary secondary lh you get rh so it is polar a protic solvent sn2 now with tertiary alkyl halide the solvent has to be polar protic and the mechanism must be sn1 as the substrate support sn2 um sorry uh, does not support sn2 so tertiary will form a carbocation and once a carbocation is formed this alpha h become acidic the hydride from lh is strongly basic 2 and in the presence of acidic h the basic nature of uh, h minus dominates over the nucleophilic nature it is because of this that with tertiary alkyl halides lh eliminates to give alkene by e1 all right so this is what happens lh h minus eliminates and tertiary supports e1 Now NaBH4 gives a weak nucleophile H delta minus. This nucleophile cannot work in SN2, so NaBH4 does not reduce primary alkyl halide, but reduces secondary and tertiary by SN1. So nucleophilic substitution has its limitations in reducing alkyl halides, as no nucleophile can reduce all the three. Whereas the best way to do it is using TPH and TBH, which will use a free radical mechanism, and this is the mechanism that you generally get. initiation step where the tributyltin hydride will break into atoms and radicals and this uh, chain propagation step the uh, h dot formed the uh, b3sn dot formed would react with rbr to uh, take the uh, br and form the r dot the r dot will then react with again uh, the tributyl tin hydride take the h and give you tributyl tin uh, radical which will propagate the steps the next method is called the clemensen's reduction of carbonyl compounds now aldehydes and ketones can be reduced to hydrocarbons by treating them with zinc amalgam in the presence of hcl Now remember zinc and acid zinc and hcl can reduce lot of compounds but if you want them to specifically reduce aldehyde or ketone you use a zinc amalgam that reduces the reactivity of zinc so they are very specific for aldehydes and ketones 
to you have a ketone or an aldehyde zinc amalgam hcl you get a hydrocarbon same is true for here but if i use dcl i get the two d's which simply implies that the h or the d that is coming from is coming from hcl not the solvent so if you look at the mechanism which is actually not required to be done but anyway you can just understand it it takes the h plus from hcl so oxygen and you get this and this has a resonating structure remember where the plus is on carbon now zinc gets oxidized to zinc ion and two electrons and then these two electrons attack the carbocation to form a carbon ion and the carbon ion in turn will take the h plus from acid to form h so remember the first h is coming again from hcl and this process gets repeated and water leaves giving you a carbocation takes two electrons forms carbon ion and this carbon ion would take h plus and form alkane now it is very important to understand that with if suppose you have an aldehyde or a ketone and apart from the aldehyde or the ketone group it has some group which can react with hcl and you don't want it to react with hcl in that case you should not use clemensens reduction so we call those groups as acid sensitive groups because they can also react with acid and you don't want that for example ether ether is a, a compound which will very easily react with acid and we'll see that when we do ethers so if you have ethers and all then clemensens reduction is not uh, the right choice so uh, the clemensens reduction should not be used in the presence of acid sensitive groups as the acid will react with those for example if you look at this one remember alcohols form alkyl halide with hcl so not only will it reduce the aldehyde or ketone it will also convert the oh into cl this is what we do saw in lucas test so if you have this remember the double bond can add hcl so this double bond o gets reduced and the hcl gets added to this double bond and giving you one carbon having h another having cl now the contrary to this is the wolf kestner reduction now here what happens is you have uh, the ketone reacting with hydrazine in the presence of base and you get this now here the two hydrogens are not coming from hydrazine they are coming from the solvent if you look at the mechanism you have the aldehyde of the ketone and you have hydrazine the lone pair on n attacks the carbon which is electrophilic and the pi bond goes to o now it will take uh, the 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 oh minus comes because it is in the presence of oh minus it takes the proton from hydrazine and this bond goes to n and you get this then now it will return the proton to o minus forming oh now again you have oh minus it will take the second proton and this goes to n and you get this and here you will get this minus attacking the carbon and the oh minus leaving giving you this and now the hydroxide attacks knocks off the next h this bond goes here to n and you get nh minus now here water will uh, now here you have nh minus it will resonate with the double bond and make the carbon as carbon ion now water uh, now this carbon ion will take the proton from water and give and uh, take an h and now the oh minus will repeat the process with the other h again a carbon ion is formed and this and n2 gas is released as you can see and this carbon ion again will react with water to form this so it is the solvent which is giving the h now this reduction again cannot be used with groups which are base sensitive so any group that can react with oh minus should not be used here say for example you have a chloride you know you have an aldehyde or a ketone and you have a chloride now the aldehyde ketone uh, will get reduced 
uh, but the chloride the rcl can easily become roh in the presence of oh minus so instead of getting cl retained in the product you will end up getting a oh so for acid for base sensitive groups do not use this reaction the next is reduction of alkyl halide using metal acid it's a pretty simple process you have zinc and hcl as i said zinc and hcl can reduce a variety of compounds and these are the possible reasons zinc with hcl tin with hcl zinc with acetic acid zinc with naoh zinc copper couple with uh, etoh al hg with etoh etc mechanism is pretty simple zinc gets oxidized and it attacks the rx to form r minus and the r minus is going to take the h plus from hcl and form rh and now we have reaction number 10 which is reduction by using red phosphorus and hi the pretty interesting one it reduces a variety of compounds like alcohols ethers aldehydes ketones carboxylic acids and its derivatives and can be reduced to hydrogen a hydrocarbon by treating them with red phosphorus and hi so basically the reaction is written like this but the basic reaction is with hi now why we use red phosphorus will uh, you will understand later on but basically the reaction is with hi So now what HI does is HI is going to break all this oxygen bonds, and it will give one H to each of these. So it will give one H here, and uh, sorry, it doesn't break the OH bond. It breaks this bond. It gives one H here and one H here to form water. So obviously, if you want to use HI to give H plus, how many HI do you think we'll use per alcohol? You will get two HI used. So you have this reacting with two HI. So what do you think will be the product? Obviously, you'll get R, CH three, water, and what will become to the I? It will form I two. What do you think will happen to this one? How many HI do you think we'll need? Now R C H O has R C double bond O H. So it will break both the bonds of O. And it needs two H for this to form water. It needs to give two H to this to form hydrocarbon. So, how many H I do you think we'll use? Obviously, four. So, I'll get uh, R C S three. I'll get H two O, and I'll get I two. Okay. How about ketone? Same logic. Double bond O requires one H. The carbon requires two H. The double bond O requires two H. The carbon requires two H, and you get four H H I, and you get I two, and water. What do you think will happen to this one? So this is how you think. This breaks. This breaks. So how many H for water? One for this. Two for this. And for carbon, there are three bonds broken, so three H for carbons. So how many H I do you think we'll use? Six H I. You get R C S three, you get three I two, and you get two H two O. If I take R C O C L, then six H I again. Why? Because R C double bond O C L break this, break this. Three H for carbon, two H for here. One H for here, so that makes it six. Here you will get HCl. And lastly, if I take amide, what do you think will happen? Well, double bond O, you need two H. NH two, you need one H. Carbon, you need three. So again, six H I. And you get ammonia and water. We'll call that as ammonium hydroxide. the mechanism of this is pretty simple you have alcohol and hi reacting and they will obviously form ri and water because in uh, h plus will protonate oh water will leave i minus will attack and you get a ri and the reverse of course can also happen if water is the solvent now this ri breaks homolytically and gives you r dot and i dot remember everything is reversible right now The R dot gets to meet an I minus and forms R I. 
आर माइनस एंड आई डॉट बिकॉज दिस ट्रांसफर्स वन इलेक्ट्रॉन टू आर डॉट इट गिव यू आर माइनस एंड आई डॉट द टू आई डॉट्स मीट गिविंग यू आई टू द आर माइनस मीट्स द एच प्लस बिकॉज यू हैव एच आई फॉर्म्स आर एच now all these things are reversible but this i2 formed can be removed by using red phosphorus because red phosphorus will convert i2 into an irreversible pi3 so the red phosphorus removes the iodine formed and drives the equilibrium reaction to completion then we have reaction number 11 called the kore house synthesis now this is where you can synthesize unsymmetrical odd numbered alkenes unlike woods reaction and kolb's reaction so you can get r r prime of your choice so the best method for preparing unsymmetrical alkanes is this one we use the gilman's reagent which is r2 cooley and gilman's reagent is unstable and is prepared in c2 so you don't get r2 cooley just like that you get rx plus 2 li 1 li will go with r 1 li will go with x and you take two of these r li and add it with copper cux cu cuprous salt two of the r's go with copper and lithium and one lithium x will form now this is a very weak nucleophile if you remember the organometallic uh, compounds which will of course do uh, later on uh, you will be able to understand that uh, this r minus can very easily uh, act as a weak nucleophile of course so r2 cooley r prime x and you get a nucleophilic attack and you get two of them you get rcu now and this rcu again will react with another r prime x so you can get the alkane of your choice you can choose whichever as the the um, r2 cooley and whichever is r prime x but remember if you have an option keep this as primary because primary can show a major substitution and then we do the last one which is by grignard's reagent which we have already discussed in organometallic compounds now here uh, and this way that we uh, end this lesson the this particular part now organometallic is something which i haven't done actually uh, generally we are supposed to do the organometallic right after aryl halide but i thought you know uh, hydrocarbons is a pretty important topic we'll do that but the next one before i make alkanes too i'm going to do organometallic so that you can have a good and broad understanding of organometallic compounds because they are very often used in these kind of processes so with that we come to the end of this part of alkanes i hope uh, you were able to learn something and as always please make notes and uh, well i'll catch you in the next one with organometallics and then we'll continue with alkanes So this is Kalyan Kumar saying goodbye. Have a wonderful and nice day, and thank you for watching this.